Jupiter's great red spot is possibly one of the most recognizable features of all the planets in the solar system. We have been studying it for centuries, watching this huge storm on Jupiter, which is bigger than the entire Earth, rage away with winds over 400 miles an hour, but also watched it shrink slowly over time. But we still don't know why it's red. We do know why the rest of Jupiter has all of these different colours, and it's to do with what Jupiter's made of, what its atmosphere is made of, so what molecules are present there. Because as sunlight comes in and hits those molecules and is reflected off all of the clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere, those molecules will actually steal away certain colours or wavelengths of light. This is the same reason that when you see like a coat that looks blue, it's because it's absorbing all of the red wavelengths of light and just reflecting back the blue wavelengths. Now because the inside of Jupiter is also very hot, because it's very dense there, you also get convection set up in the atmosphere. Essentially hot things rising and cool things falling, creating this cycle. Which means that as heavier molecules actually sink in Jupiter's atmosphere, they get dredged up again by this convection brought to the top of the atmosphere, and that's what gives the different regions of Jupiter different colours. It sets up these stripes or bands where you've also got wind blowing in the opposite directions and you get some very weird and wonderful things going on on the boundaries of those stripes. So you would think that the great red spot is red for a similar reason, that this raging storm is dredging up some molecule that makes it red. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So how do we actually go about doing this? How do you work out what is Jupiter's great red spot made of and what gives it its colour? What we do is we isolate the light that's reflected just off the great red spot, just in that one small area. And we take that light and we pass it through a prism to split the light into all of its different colours, or wavelengths, and then you make a trace of how much light of each wavelength you receive. If the Great Red Spot reflected all the sunlight of all different wavelengths back the same amounts, then essentially that spectrum would be flat. But if you've got molecules absorbing the bluer wavelengths and just reflecting the red ones, then you'd expect a different shape and some bumps and gaps in the spectrum where there's those molecules absorbing those wavelengths. Now from studies in labs here on Earth, we know what the effect of certain molecules is on light. We've been able to record what their absorption spectrum is, the wavelengths of light that they absorb. So that once you then get a spectrum, okay, for what does Jupiter's great red spot spectrum look like, you can then sort of like put together a recipe of molecules, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, that could explain the shape of the spectrum of Jupiter's great red spot that we actually see. The problem is, we've never been able to do that to any degree of accuracy. We've not been able to recreate it well enough to know exactly what it's made of. Now that's not for lack of trying, there's been sort of three main options that people have looked at. The first one is phosphorus, specifically in a molecule of P4. The second is ammonium hydrosulfide, or NH4SH. And number three, something that's known as chromophores, that come from a reaction between ammonia, NH3, and acetylene, C2H2. So let's start with the first one on that list. Phosphorus. In 1975, Prynne and Lewis suggested that the red colour could be from four atoms of phosphorus bonded together. And that was after a molecule called phosphine had been detected in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Phosphine is one atom of phosphorus bonded to three atoms of hydrogen, pH3. Now phosphine, pH3, can be broken apart if it's hit by a photon of light from the sun. And again and again in this sequence to make hydrogen, H2 molecules, and P4, which is white phosphorus, which again, if you expose it to sunlight, can rearrange its crystal structure to give P4S, aka red 
phosphorus. That was the idea anyway, and it was a very promising idea, but it was quickly dismissed after the results of a few studies through the 80s and 90s, just to highlight a few. For example, Noy, Podolak and Barnett, who tried to recreate the mix of hydrogen and phosphine in Jupiter's atmosphere and expose it to sunlight, but could only produce yellow phosphorus, not red phosphorus. And then a study by Jeune in 1996, who analyzed the data collected during Voyager 1's flyby of Jupiter and found no more phosphine in the Great Red Spot than the rest of Jupiter. And the models of Prynne and Lewis that said, okay, this is how much phosphine you need to make this much red phosphorus to make the Great Red Spot red, didn't match the Voyager 1 data at all. So what about that second option there? Ammonium hydrosulfide, NH4SH which is a salt that was proposed as an option for Jupiter's great red spot colour in 1986. And this idea gained favour when all of the gas giant planets were found to have ammonium hydrosulfide in their atmospheres. And in particular, low down in Jupiter's atmosphere in very high concentrations. The problem with ammonium hydrosulfide is that to do a test in the lab to you know, try and create Jupiter's atmosphere and see what you find, you need to react together two chemicals to make ammonium hydrosulfide. And they are ammonium and hydrogen sulfide. Two very, very smelly gases, think like concentrated urine and rotten eggs, that are also very toxic in high concentrations. And in the case of hydrogen sulfide, also poisonous, corrosive, and flammable. So they're not exactly materials that you want to bring into the lab. But Luffler and Hudson took one for the team in 2017 and showed that with the right and showed that with the right conditions, so you know the right exposure to radiation and the temperature, they could get the ammonium hydrosulfide that they'd made to turn red. But when they compared to Hubble Space Telescope observations of the Great Red Spot, so here shown by the points, circles were from observations in 1995, diamonds from 2008, and then the filled diamonds from 2015, none of their three ways of irradiating and heating their ammonium hydrosulfide could replicate the spectrum of the Great Red Spot at any of those epochs that had been observed. So again, despite this being a popular idea, because of the high concentrations of ammonium hydrosulfide low down in Jupiter, atmosphere that could be dredged up by these storms, it doesn't look like that ammonium hydrosulfide is responsible for the great red spots, red colour. So what about number three on our list? Chromophores from the reactions between NH3, ammonia again, and then acetylene, C2H2. Now chromophores is essentially a fancy word for the part of the molecule that does the absorbing of the light that we can see with our eyes, the visible light. And a reaction between ammonia and acetylene essentially creates a very big mix of molecules that contain lots of different types of these chromophores. So molecules that contain imines, for example, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, or molecules that contain methyl, CH3, or methylene, CH2, and so on. It's a real mix, and they all have a different effect on light. Now, this was work by Carlson and collaborators in 2016, who did this reaction and created this mix to once again compare to observations. Hubble Space Telescope observations are shown here in the points, and then you've also got a spectrum shown by the blue line there that comes from the Cassini mission flyby of Jupiter in 2000. Compare that then to the red curves in the panel above, which are the spectra from the lab mix of chromophores exposed for different lengths of time. It definitely looks promising, it gives the right sort of shape here, but you can't quite compare like for like because it massively depends on where these reactions between ammonia and acetylene are actually taking place in Jupiter's atmosphere to give you these chromophores. So this research group also looked at this problem in this work led by Baines in 2019, and they looked at three different models, shown in the black lines here in all three of these panels, compared to the spectrum of the Great Red Spot from Cassini, shown as a red shaded region. It's shaded rather than a solid line because they wanted to represent the uncertainty in that measurement as well. You're going to have some noise, you're going to have some measurement error, and so it's sort of saying, all right, the spectrum's somewhere in this region that we're showing by this red shaded section. 
So the first model in panel A there, these chromophores coat all the clouds in the great red storm. Or in model B in the middle panel, they form a haze high up in Jupiter's atmosphere in the stratosphere. Or in model C in the bottom panel, the chromophores form a thin layer at the top of the clouds. Something the team came to call the creme brulee model because it was analogous to that thin sugar layer that you get on the top of a creme brulee. You can also see that in each of these panels, the researchers give a number called chi squared, chi being a Greek alphabet letter. It's essentially a test of how good your model fit is compared to your data. You sum up the difference between the model data point and the data point that you've observed. And so the smaller the overall number, the smaller that overall sum is, the closer your model data points are to your observed data points. And so the better your model fit is. And so Baines and collaborators claim that this creme brulee model plotted in that bottom panel there, panel C, of a layer of these chromophores created by the reaction of ammonia and acetylene can explain the great red spots colour best. And you might be thinking, well, that looks like a great fit, Becky. Surely we know the answer now to the colour of Jupiter's great red spot. But the problem is getting enough ammonia and acetylene up in Jupiter's atmosphere, dredged up from where it will sink to, to actually react together to give enough of these chromophores in a high enough concentration to create that layer and give it a red enough colour. Our other models of Jupiter that we have from you know, other studies looking at the dynamics of the atmosphere, how it behaves, how it moves, they can't give you enough transfer of ammonia and acetylene up into the higher reaches of Jupiter's atmosphere to account for all of this that you would need to fit this creme brulee model of Baines and collaborators. So to make this work, you'd need to think of ways that the chromophores could build up over time. And Baines and collaborators do discuss this in their paper. And they say, okay, well, maybe the vortex of Jupiter's great red spot is what keeps the concentrations high. It sort of keeps everything in that region. Or maybe also this could be triggered by lightning in Jupiter's atmosphere. But what that means is that we still don't have an adequate enough explanation for the color of Jupiter's great red spot or one that can explain why it's been changing colour from red to brown as reported by Simon and collaborators back in 2015. The hope is that data from the Juno mission will eventually help solve this mystery as researchers discover more about the composition, the structure, the temperature and the dynamics of Jupiter's clouds. But at the minute, it just seems like we've got too many missing puzzle pieces to solve this unsolved mystery of why Jupiter's great red spot is red. Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant.org is a website and an app that helps you to learn by doing. Honestly, I love Brilliant and I think it is the best way to learn something in science or maths interactively so that you're not just passively listening to a lecture or video or memorizing equations, but learning in a visual hands-on way, which has been proven to be six times more effective than passive learning. So you create programs with drag and drop code or you interact with graphs and play around with stunning data visualization. Now, Brilliant was built for busy people like me. I love that they break down very big, you know, what seems like an unmanageable topic into these bite-sized chunks so that you can gradually cover a concept, you know, just by doing 15 minutes each day from anywhere, whether on your phone, on your tablet or computer. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. And now, roll those bloopers. We do know why the rest of Jupiter are the colours that it is. Is the colours that they are? Is the rest of Jupiter, is the colour that... Is it a singular or is it a plural? Space is hard, words are harder. Circular nature where lots of heavier molecules 
molecule, essentially heat rising and cold things uh, drop, dropping, right, it's the opposite, rising, rising and falling, falling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just gotta dig it is today. <laughs> See that the red color of the great red spook, spook? <laughs> Prin and Lewis's model for how much phosphine you'd need to produce enough red phosphorus to make the red spot, great, great, red spot red. 